Alright. So, now we're going to proceed with the discussion of a particular property of amino acids, which is, of course, their charge. Anyway, that is the way that we classify them, right? Based on the capability for their R groups to elicit a charge or not. Now, it is given that all amino acids that we're going to, to discuss, or that we have just discussed in structure, always have two functional groups at the minimum, which is part of their constant uh, portion, right? And that is the acidic carboxyl group and the basic amino group. And as I've said, and as I would just like to recall, the acidic group, when charged, becomes negative. And for the amino group, when charged, becomes positive. So here, we're going to see how adjusting pH would actually give the negative charge to the carboxyl group and how the pH could actually give the positive charge to the basic uh, amino functional group. And that would depend on the interaction between the pH of the environment and the pKa values of these functional groups. Here, I'm going to discuss what happens if I adjust the pH of the environment to these two groups. So, the pKa value of these groups will not change, alright, because there are intrinsic factors of the, of the amino acid's structure. And the only thing you can change is the pH of the environment if you titrate it. If you add a, um, a base, its pH would naturally increase. And if you add an acid, its pH would, of course, go down. That's, that's basic chemistry for you. But here, let's see what happens if the pH is low, something below 7, all right? And um, I have these two functional groups right here. Well, if I have uh, an acidic functional group, all right, given their bronsted lowry definition, which is a proton donor, and also with a basis with their bronsted lowry definition of being a proton acceptor, um, we should note that in this acidic pH, there is a high concentration of protons. All right? If there is a high concentration of protons in the environment, if I am a proton donor and there is a high concentration of protons, I do not need to donate my protons anymore. I mean, do you get the logic? I will only give out my protons if there is a low concentration of protons, wherein, but wherein this environment actually has a lot of that. So if I have a COOH OOH here, I will not give out this proton, alright? But if I am a proton acceptor and this range right here has a lot of protons, then I, if I am NH2, I would get this because, again, there's a lot of protons. So maybe it wouldn't, maybe this amino group would say, maybe it wouldn't be too much if I get one of those. And that actually means that in a low uh, pH, in an acidic pH, the basic functional group becomes positively charge. Now, if I go to a higher pH, something like 7 to 14, but again, depends on the pKa. We're going to assume that the pKa of both the acidic and basic functional groups here is also 7, alright? So, assuming that we have here a basic pH, and of course, there's a low concentration of protons here. And of course, I just mentioned that this guy here will deny protons if there's only a low concentration of protons here and that's the case here in a basic pH so this just means if the pH of if the pH exceeds the pKa of an acidic functional group it will now become negatively charged because it has already released its protons in order to compensate for the low concentration um, opposite to this basic functional group if there is a low concentration of hydrogen ions, this guy here would be thinking, hey, there's a low concentration of protons here. What am I do doing with this? It wouldn't be too bad also if I just give this out because in the first place, I am already neutral. Alright? Same thing. It will give out a proton. Alright? So this just means that let's make conclusions. I'll write it in red. If I have an acidic functional group in an acidic pH, well, we have a neutral acidic functional group. But if I have an acidic group in a basic pH, it becomes now 
negatively charged. Same, um, vice versa here, if I have an acidic pH, the basic functional group will become positively charged, while in, we're in, I mean, while if in a basic pH, the basic functional group becomes neutral. So as you can see, if you have uh, an acidic in an acidic, it's neutral. Basic in a basic, that's neutral also. Uh, another way that you could look at this uh, interpretation. Now, with that said and done, I'm actually, I, I, I actually just use this to clarify you guys on the next topic, which is the topic of titratable groups. So I, I'll write the, the topic here, titratable groups. And coming from the word titratable, it means that these are functional groups that actually react depending on, um, I mean, they react to titration. Meaning, if I add an acid or add a base, of course, they're going to adjust pH. And so that means that titratable group groups will give charge depending on how you adjust the pH. So I explain that a little um, more clearly here in a little more detail. But for purposes of clarity, I'm already going to use an example amino acid. And here I'm going to use aspartic acid. As I said a while ago, a functional group that can give a charge, whether negative or positive, must have a particular pKa value. So that it, it must be uh, clear now that since all amino acids, all 20 amino acids have both of these, they automatically have at least two pKa values. But in addition, in addition, we have R groups that can give charges, right? We have acidic R groups, aspartic acid and glutamic acid. So they have an R group pKa also. And for example, I have aspartic acid. Other than the fact that I have pKa values for its COOH and NH2, I also have a pKa value for its R group, which is actually an acidic functional group. All right, so as you can see here, this is the structure of uh, aspartic acid. Again, this is the portion constant in 20 amino acids but in addition to that we have an additional uh, one more uh, acidic functional group here so as a total aspartic acid has one basic titratable group and one acidic and two acidic titratable groups giving us a total of three pKa's so what what does it uh, how do we understand this now so at pH 1 all right at pH 1, it, the pH will not exceed any of this. So what does it mean? All acidic functional groups become neutral, right? And all basic functional groups become positive. Here, the only basic functional group here is amino. So following what we have just discussed, in pH 1, this guy here must be NH3 positive and again if the pH is less than the pKa for an acidic group the COOH will remain COOH and so at pH 1 um, the total charge actually as you can see here neutral neutral positive one so it is positive one in charge while in pH3, what happened? We have already exceeded the pKa of the COOH. And that is actually the COOH of the constant part. Huh? Alright. And so what happens if the pH exceeds the pKa of an acidic group again? It becomes negative. So this guy right here, this one, this one, this one becomes negative. And since it didn't exceed the pKa of the other two, they remain the same. I, I hope you're, uh, you guys are trying are getting this slowly. At page 4, we have now exceeded the pKa of the R group. So, just like this one, since this is also an acidic functional group or titratable group, alright, it also becomes now negative. Alright? And we copy the other two because they're not affected. And finally, at pH 10, we have already exceeded the pKa value for the amino group. 
this one. And again, just to make it even clear, double checking it. If we have now the pKa of this and we have the pH greater than the pKa of a basic group, it becomes neutral from positive. So it becomes neutral again, it becomes NH2 instead of NH3. And then we copy the remaining two because they are also unaffected. Or they have already given a charge a while ago. So we can see that as we increase pH, as we increase the pH here, our charges go down all right it's like an inverse proportion <laughs> it's like an inverse proportion for example here positive one we gain an additional negative one here so positive one negative one it cancels out right zero then here what happened is that we had an additional negative charge so it's positive one minus one minus one is equal to negative one and obviously here we lost already the positive one so we have here negative one minus one equals negative two so increase in pH would mean a uh, low lowering of the total charge of the amino acid. All right. But another thing I would like to mention here is that there's uh, something special about this uh, part here. All right, as you can see, it has a net net charge of zero, but it's not because the entire structure is absent in charge, but it has one positive charge and one negative charge, meaning that it, an amino acid will never really in reality become zero as in no charge at all. It will have a zero net charge, but it will be the result of one positive one charge and one negative one charge. And this uh, state of the amino acid here, uh, acid here is known as the Zwitter ion. Right. That's a German word, right? but that's the term for the state of the amino acid where it's charge zero. But um, arising here is also another term important for us to know because as you can see here, all right, as you can see here, we have um, the Zwitter ion flanking between two pKa values, two pKa values here. All right, the, the, the moment we adjusted to zero, that is because we exceeded the first pKa of the three, right, which is 2.10, 2.10. And the second, the pKa value which we exceeded was 3.86. Meaning that if we add, if we add 2.10 and 3.86 and get their averages, for example, six, divided by 2, that will give us a result of uh, 2.98. Is it correct? 2.98 something. Um, let me check with the calculator. Sorry. 5.98. Yeah, 2.98. So if we get uh, the average of these two pKa values flanking this bitter ion, that will actually mean that this pH is the pH where you get the most number of Zwitter ions. And that pH is known as the isoelectric pH. Or some uh, people say, uh, I mean, it's usually termed like I pH, something like that. Or some people use actually PI, but in um, Philippines, I don't think PI is a better term. And based on how I did the IPH, the formula for the IPH is something I write in red. IPH again is equal to pKa1, which is the value of the pKa before reaching the Zwitter ion, plus pKa2, which is the value after reaching the Zwitter ion, divided by so again this is the formula for the IPH or the isoelectric pH so that's uh, basically the um, fundamentals of the titratable groups in amino acids and we'll get a little more detail on that as we proceed with proteins